Hello, and welcome to Reimagining Love. I'm Dr. Alexandra Solomon. I have been studying relationships for over 20 years as a couples therapist, a professor, an award-winning author, and as a wife, mother, daughter, sister, and friend. Now, I'm inviting you into this space each week as I dig into some of the toughest and most fascinating relational dilemmas of our time. If you want to discover how to create vibrant and loving relationships in your own life, you have come to the right place. This is Reimagining Love. Hello and welcome back to Reimagining Love. Today, we are exploring the parent-child bond with my guest and my friend, Daphna Lender. Daphna is a family therapy expert, an attachment specialist, a licensed clinical social worker, and an international trainer and supervisor for practitioners who work with children and families. Daphna is the author of the new book, Integrative Attachment Family Therapy, and the co-author of TheraPlay, The Practitioner's Guide. She teaches and supervises clinicians in 15 countries in four languages, English, Hebrew, French, and Spanish. Daphna's expertise comes from years of working with families across a wide spectrum of settings in at-risk after-school programs, therapeutic foster care, in-home crisis stabilization, residential care, and within private practice. Daphna's style, whether she is a therapist or a teacher, combines the lighthearted with the profound and centers the role of play in healing work. She is a certified trainer and a supervisor and a consultant in both TheraPlay and Dyadic Developmental Psychotherapy, DDP, as well as an EMDR therapist. She's got 25 years of experience. And so she brings this deep understanding of how a child's difficult behavior and a parent's reactivity can clash and then land the family in a therapist's office. I've had a lot of walks and coffees and conversations with Daphna over the years. And every time we talk about the work that she does, I end up with chills and with tears in my eyes. She really is the best of the best. And today she's here to discuss integrative attachment family therapy, which is the model of family therapy that she has developed. Integrative attachment family therapy is a powerful intervention approach that addresses a wide array of issues that may emerge in families. And instead of viewing the child as the problem, Daphna's model addresses the crux of the issue, the misalignment in the parent-child relationship. So in this conversation, you're going to hear Daphna share stories and lessons from her years of working with parents and children, stories that illustrate the power of the healing process. What are the unique challenges that bring children to therapy? And why does Daphna so firmly believe that parents and children need to be in the room together? Well, Daphna shines a light on why understanding a parent's attachment history is so important to navigating current family dynamics. Most importantly, Daphna and I talk about the importance of letting go of blame during repair processes and centering joy, even in the most challenging moments. And then finally, we talk about a listener question, speaking to those who are considering whether or not to have kids. And in this conversation, Daphna shares a bit of wisdom on the profoundly existential experience of parenthood. Parenting is such a uniquely challenging and joyful journey, especially for those of us who are engaging in our own inner work. As we step into parenthood, we are forced to reckon with our own past as we confront the hidden messages and the blueprints that we inherited that now end up emerging despite our best efforts. So whether you're a clinician, a parent examining your relationship with your child, or an adult re-examining your relationship with your own parents, I know you're going to find some really valuable insights in this conversation. Enjoy. Daphna, thank you for joining me in studio today. My distinct honor. 
When I was getting ready, of course, I was getting ready by reading your fantastic new book, but I was also just like thinking about our friendship. And I was having like a little like montage of all different memories, you know, of times we've shared together and things that we've done and lunches and walks in Evanston and that time that we were at Psychotherapy Networker doing that eye gaze meditation led by Jack Cornfield and like sobbing my eyes out, like seeing into your soul and So I was thinking about all these memories and thinking about my favorite part is I don't know when I met you. Like I have no memory of where and when I met you. I just am like, I don't know, Daphne's in my world and that's just how it is. (laughs) That's awesome. You know, it's funny. I did the exact same thing with you and our memories. You were the person who inspired me to write my first story for Psychotherapy Networker. And from there, I began to believe that I'm a writer. So you're, I'm very grateful to you for that. That kind of makes me really emotional to think about it. So thank you. Me too. Yeah. Me too. Oh, that's so beautiful. Yeah, that's what I, we live in pretty different places in terms of the sort of clinician ecosystem. Your work as we're going to dive into is really supporting parents and children and that bond and that relationship. And my work is much more about couples, obviously. But when I have had the chance to, whenever I I hear you talk about your work or when we're in a professional setting together and I hear you talk about your work, I just am so floored and I have so much respect for the work that you do. Like your integrity is really clear. Your passion is really clear. For as much as I love you as a friend, I just have such admiration for who you are in this field. That's awesome. (laughs) Thank you so much. Okay. Well, let's also, I want to hear your, I want to hear you talk a little bit about the relational self-awareness question that I ask all of the guests. So can I throw you the question and see what you want to do with it? Sure. Go ahead. Okay. So Daphna, how are you reimagining love in one of your important relationships these days? Yeah. Well, I got divorced and I spent 20 years with my ex-husband, right? And I think it was the right thing to do. And I'm still in relationship with him because we have a daughter and it's really obviously changed. I am having a struggle with just keeping him in my life and putting in a boundary so that I don't go back to the sadness and the idea of, you know, that I have this person who is my family, who I love and who is not my husband anymore. And I have to move on and I'm in a new relationship and I don't have room for both of those. So it's like the, I still grapple with this idea of how could I have been married to somebody for 20 years and then say goodbye to that because I need to actively move on. And, you know, is that reimagining love? I suppose it is since it's this just transition from active love to really needing to say goodbye, but still loving that person and honoring that person. And it's been very, very much a stretch ultimately to be able to say, no, I can't be in this place of like friendship right now because I need to move on. And how painful that is when you have to see the person because you share a child and a dog and that you have to see them, you know, twice or three times a week and things like that. It's just quite a thing, mm-hmm. quite a thing to get divorced. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. So I can imagine that there are so many people listening to the show right now who are walking that walk alongside you. And I don't know that we make near enough space for people to be able to name all of the complexity that you just named. But I, I hear how really real it is for you. And I hear that you are grappling with it and you are finding ways to carry all of it. It's to be carried, right? It's not to be fixed. There's not like doors to be closed and locked and all of that. It's just ways of kind of how do you hold on to all the complexity, the grief, and also the new possibility because you're in a relationship that you're excited about and you have to carry all of that just gently and and in imperfect ways, right? Like yeah, a, really imperfect. Yeah. You know, the, the question of reimagining love, it's like, how am I reimagining love for myself? To say, I can't be friends with you to my ex and to close the door on that for now mm-hmm. is saying, I love myself because I can't carry the guilt mm-hmm. and have the stirred up feelings and move forward. 
Mm. And I'm the kind of person who never gives up on relationships and is super loyal to the point of fault, you know, that everybody says to me, like, you're too nice and things like that. And it's wrapped up in my history and guilt and things yeah. like that. Yeah. So, you know, it's a real practice to be like, no, I actually, I have to let this go. Right. So how how complicated and sort of seemingly paradoxical to say, I can't be friends with you precisely because of the love and because of like, it's it's a strain. We feel like those things don't go together. We, we step away from relationships because this like sort of, it's not healthy for me is different in this relationship with your ex-husband. It's not healthy for me is it keeps me in a place that I really do need to move out from possibly so that down the road, there can be something different, but the, something different, what you are finding is something different can't show up until you have this chapter of really stepping away and saying, I cannot, I can't do friendship right now. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for asking such a provocative question because I actually never really articulated it until now. Oh, thank you. So my dear, you are, you are the creator of a robust, integrative, powerful model of therapy called Integrative Attachment Family Therapy. And you are the author now of a new book, which is a beautiful, rich, like you are holding a clinician's hand, offering all of the wisdom that you've been gathering for years and years and years, and really like helping the clinician, the reader, understand the theory, the theory of attachment, the neuroscience behind your approach, and then also just giving so much detail of how do you start the relationship? Where do you go in the relationship? How do you guide the relationship? What are the things you're looking for? What are the stumbling blocks? It's just a beautiful guide that you wrote for clinicians. But I mean, I'm going to sort of argue that it's also for parents, curious parents. I would, I would love for you to start by telling us about this framework of integrative attachment family therapy. Okay. Well, it's my favorite topic. So <laughs> let me just start with saying that my biggest plug here is that I want clinicians and I want families who are accessing, trying to access therapy to know that they should be working with parents and children together. No such thing as dropping your kid off to a therapist while you go and sit in the lobby. You really want parents to, to know that, listen, if that's the approach, I want you to be thinking twice because why? Why is it so important to have right. a parent and a child in the room together? Why? Well, my experience with clinicians that I've been supervising, I've been practicing family therapy, attachment focused family therapy for 27 years. Okay. And many people who work with kids shy away from working with the parent and the child together in the room. They will either work with the child alone or they'll work with the parent, but they don't do the work together. And there's a whole lot of really very valid super messy reasons why people avoid that. And one of my biggest concerns is it is truly a waste of time and money and the child doesn't get the help they need. That's the essence of what I'm driving at is that because we don't, we as clinicians don't have the skill and don't want to do it because we're afraid or didn't get the training, the children don't get the help that they need. The families don't. And we're just letting intergenerational trauma go forward indefinitely. And then we treat the adults when they come to us as adults. So that's the big conundrum here is that mm -hmm. it would be really great if we could address childhood trauma before the child becomes an adult. Okay. So when I go to conferences, whether it's Psychotherapy Networker or the International Trauma Conference or this and that, there is such a small percentage on working with children. And when it is about children, it's focused on the individual child as if the anxiety is housed inside the child. Well, from my perspective, a child, depending on the age, and it goes all the way up through many teenagers would need this too, what I'm saying. They either, the child feels that the problem is a relational problem, that they have a problem with their parent, they're angry at them, they're disappointed, they feel rejected, whatever, or that the problem that they're having, let's say, which is outside of the parent-child relationship at school or body image issues or whatever, that they don't feel that their parent understands them. And mm -hmm. that from the attachment perspective, we are, our need to feel understood by and connected with and 
having that sense of my parent really sees me and accepts me is the number one foundation for being able to build on mental health and to build on skills that we are usually teaching the child alone in the room, in the skill building or in the cognitive approach. And so I think that that primacy on the attachment relationship on the need for the child to have their parent deeply understand and accept them is at the root of, I don't know what kind of percentages I could give, but much more of a higher percentage than we are aware of as clinicians. And that's why the work needs to be, you know, focused on that parent-child relationship. There's so much talk about attachment, attachment styles, attachment strategies, so much talk about intergenerational trauma. And yet it is, it is all reparative work that we are doing with adults or as adults. And what you're saying is like, hello world, this is how we break it. This is how we transform it right here, right now. If we're going to bring a child to therapy and invest those kinds of resources, we've got to really understand the power of the parent. And I can imagine, okay, I want you to talk about two areas of constraint. What gets in a therapist's way, Mm -hmm. all those, you said, kind of messy, complicated reasons that therapists are scared or hesitant or unwilling to have parent and child in the room together. But then I want to move to what are the ways that a parent might be kind of confused or flummoxed or feeling like, no, I can't, or I shouldn't be involved in this treatment. So Start with the therapist. Though. Like, what's keeping therapists from bringing parent and child together in a room with them? Right. It is so messy to begin with to have a child in therapy. They often don't want to come. They're not verbal when they don't feel like it. They are messy and they misbehave. So the parent in the room makes the therapist feel like they're essentially being compared with or are on trial and the parent is judging them. There's the sense of needing to please the parent. And so the therapist is feeling like a child vis-a-vis the parent. There's a lot of those family dynamics that are coming up for the therapist. And the need to balance what the child needs versus what the parent needs, I think we don't get any training on how to prioritize that, how to structure that. The sense is, is that a parent comes in and wants to rail against the child or express, you know, what the agenda is. And the therapist needs to be a really strong manager of the safety in the room. And that is an additional skill that people who work with children don't get the family therapy skill set that you need if you're a couples therapist or if you're doing the traditional family systems work with a whole group of people, like family members. And so a lot of times you end up feeling out of control, humiliated, just mixed allegiances. And the dissatisfaction the parent feels from their point of view makes you feel like I'm going to lose my client and I won't have any, any client here. Many things are very much personal, like how it feels to be in a session with a parent and child and how much it evokes in us. And some of it is we just don't have the skill. And that's really One of the things the book is that I wrote is bringing to clinician is just offering a framework and enumerating the skills that you need to work on and to apply in order to be able to facilitate a parent and child therapy session or just a treatment overall, a treatment, because there's also a really, really strong parent component. So in my treatment, if you look at the number of sessions with parent alone versus parent and child together, it's about 50% the parent alone. Yeah. And that is a whole other reason that clinicians shy away from working with parents is because they feel like the parents don't want to be in the spotlight. They don't want to have to work on their stuff. Yeah. And we want our clients to like us. We want to yeah. do what the client wants. We don't want to challenge the parent. And so we don't require them or put out in front that this is my model and it requires the parent working on their stuff too. But I think it's really, really fair to be upfront and honest with the parents about what I think is going to work best. I'm not saying that every family that walks in the door, every child that walks in the door of clinician's office needs to be seen dyadically with one of their parents. 
it's if you make the evaluation that this is a relational issue or that the issue of the child could be greatly helped by the parent being active in it. And that is so common, so common that the therapist then spell out what's going to be necessary optimally. Yeah. And if the parent declines, okay, well then here is going to be the outcome. It's not going to work as effectively. It's going to take longer. Yeah. It's very, very upfront. One of the things I think you do really well, because I think there is this dance that you have to do. If you're saying to the parent, listen, your involvement in this treatment is essential. I'm going to be working with you around your own attachment stuff, your own attachment history, while I'm also helping your child's developing sense of self and healing the space between you. It's like, you've got to figure out how to convey all that without the parent hearing, this is all your fault, mom. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That is like one of the biggest shocks of becoming a parent. I think it's absolutely the most personal experience and the most, you know, heart wrenching and and challenging experience to be a parent. Yeah. It's all goes really well. If your child is a very comfortable reflection of what your values and beliefs are, you know, you have bumps on the road and you might have little challenges around X, Y, or Z and adolescence and so on. But when your child is acting out or is not reflecting what your uh, values are and is injuring you and rejecting you and it's chronic, you get to the point where you're just broken apart and you feel like you're absolutely the most no good, rotten person. It hits you to your core, right? And then you come to a therapist and then they say, Mm -hmm. hey, I'm going to be working with you and your attachment issues. Well, no wonder. Yeah, you are going to feel like, Mm -hmm. yeah, I knew it was all my fault. I knew you were going to tell me that. And then, of course, they have a bunch of reactions. One could be to be very defensive and hostile and leave. And another one can be, you know, where they're going to feel super guilty and fall apart, et cetera. So that's why I like in my, what I call my manifesto, quote unquote, in my book, I wrote it out. But I just, I want people to know what is family therapy from an attachment perspective. And one of the tenets, the first tenet is the way you were raised influences non-consciously, especially when you're having a hard time with the child, how you raise your child. And in order for me to be able to help you, I need to know and be able to work with your attachment history. Mm -hmm. And it's not related to any one particular person. It's all of us. And so this is the protocol is going to be that I'm going to talk to you about your own attachment history in the second session. And then after that, we'll evaluate. But the likelihood that I'm going to spend at least every fourth session with you that's going to be a parent only session, that's the the least amount of the most infrequent, you know, session order of seeing the parent alone. In other words, I might see you every other time alone, depending on what comes up in the parent child therapy. And that's just written. So it's Mm -hmm. a protocol that doesn't, it makes it seem less personal that there's something wrong with you specifically. And also just putting that tenet out there. This is where I come from. And this is my attachment perspective helps, I think, the parents to feel less attacked. Yes. At the beginning. Okay. Yes. But that's only at the beginning. <laughs> right. And then before you the, actually have coached them in a session to, yeah. Okay. Exactly. They mm-hmm. still feel attacked yeah. and blamed. And the parent only sessions are a lot about nurturing and repairing that relationship with the parent and making them feel like, they are the most important person in the world to their child and that I see all the things that they've done for their child and all the sacrifices Mm -hmm. they're made and all the efforts they're making. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. it's stunning to what extent you need to do that Mm -hmm. in parent-child therapy. Mm -hmm. And that's actually almost the number one reason why I have to have frequent parent-only sessions is to reassure the parent. Yes. I see you. You are amazing. I don't care how many mistakes you made and how many times you've repeated the same thing that you meant to say, you know, you didn't mean to yell at your kid or spank them or whatever. I got you. You tell so many beautiful stories in the book. You tell a story about a single mom of a, I think she's 12 and she was adopted and had an extensive early trauma history. And this mama is worn out, depleted, really hopeless. And you, you kind of revisit the story throughout the book. Mm -hmm. And one of the stories you tell where you only have mom in the room is that you cue up a portion of 
video that you had made and you, the two of you, you and the mama sit side by side watching this video and you really want this mom to take in, like, look at how your daughter's looking at you. Look at how she softens when you're whatever it was that they were doing. And so you really are like wanting the parent to feel their power because so much of that power is like, oh my God, I have the power to hurt my kid. I can't believe I'm doing all this damage to my kid. I can't believe I've messed them up. But you want them to also know like you are so powerful in the healing of your child. Like this story is not over. Like look what just happened right here, right now. Exactly. Oh, thanks for saying that because it really transmits in your voice that the power of that story that I was trying to convey. This girl did not want to talk or revisit her trauma. She had a terrible trauma history and she would never talk to her mom when she came back from school. Her mom would say, how was school? What do you want for dinner? And the girl would never answer. And this mom was just devastated by the feeling of rejection. So when we were doing that session, one of the things I do is I make sure that we do really fun activities in a therapy session that are silly and connecting and involve touch and movement. And the thing that we were doing in this activity, we took hand lotion and I put it on the girl's arms and then the mom held on to the girl's arms and then she (laughs) slid backwards and fell over and pretended that she was falling over and it was for this girl who is 12 right but inside she has this younger need of having those kinds of really really very (laughs) primary attachment activities so it's kind of like peekaboo when you fall over and you come back up and so when she mom popped back up the girl was like this Come on, she had her hands up in the air and she was like saying, Can you hold me, hold me again? Yeah. And so when I showed the mom that, she looked in disbelief and thought, I think that my daughter is faking it. And I was just like, Oh, wow. I understand how profound this mother's sense of rejection is Mm -hmm. and also where her template is coming from, from her early experience. From from mom's own early experience. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I thought, Wow. And I said to her, wow, okay, hold on a second. I want you to watch this over again. And then I had her watch and I said, you can't fake that. And she's (laughs) like, could it be? So she was just like thinking for this, you know, once I showed her to her the second time, like what she was looking at me and the video again and thinking, could this be true what you're saying? I said, no, yeah, you can't fake that. So that's also just the power of having those parent sessions and being able to expand psychically make room for the positive things and me being able to see her Mm -hmm. capacity as a mom somebody needs to see that right yes and say you're a good mom somebody needs to say that those little things that we did together to make her feel like a better mom and it was through the activities by the way as I said the girl just shut down completely when we tried to talk about her story it built the little blocks of where the mother was finally, the adoptive mother was finally able to dare to reach out to her daughter and touch her or sit with her and just stay steady rather than running away from her. And that really cascaded into a lot more positive interactions and that sense of like, wow, wow, wow. She sees me as a mom. Yeah, Like she wants me to make her ramen. I feel really good about that. I mean, as you're, as you're telling that story, like, I'm just, I'm kind of like moving in my mind between all the yeah. different kind of positions. And I think one of the things that's required to practice as a therapist in this way, and something, something I really admire about you is like, you as a therapist have to really like, let yourself be seen because you as a therapist are letting, like, you're leading the play, you know, mm-hmm. like you're letting your face be really silly. You're letting your body be really playful. Like there's so much kind of regulation that you have to create in your own body as a therapist in order to invite parent and child into that space of like playfulness and really seeing each other. It's really true. You know, I'm a therapy practitioner before anything else. So, and therapy taught me how to do that, which is to lead a parent and child through these interactive, highly engaging, very nurturing, very much involved with touch on the floor. And it took me years to develop that skill to the point where I almost feel like as though I've spent my whole adult career honing that skill. Mm -hmm. And yet I don't want 
people to think, the clinicians to think that they can't facilitate these kinds of activities because they haven't had years and years of training. I think just right. doing something, one of the tenets is that if therapy for a parent and child is not like fun and connecting and pleasurable and has an element of nurture in it, the kid's not going to want to come. Okay. And so that's a, there's a very practical reason why you should get out the balloons and play like balloon tennis and not make it focused on like uh, the score and rules yeah, yeah. and lessons and yeah. social skills, yeah, but more just on that attachment. So yeah, people say, how can you, you know, how can you do this? Like you have a quite an array, a range of skills available to do these sessions and then you're making it seem like easier than it looks in real life. You know, isn't that their, our job now as senior clinicians to show what we do and then people can be inspired to learn more. I guess I'm thinking also about like somebody who's listening, you know, who, who is a, perhaps a parent or an auntie or an uncle, you know, or a step parent and so much of what you want us as adults who've got little people in our lives to be aware of is the power of our own nonverbals, the power of our own presence. Like what are some best practices or things that you'd want to be whispering into a parent or an auntie or a you know stepdad around what are the things that you want that grown up to kind of keep in mind when they are engaging with a little one? I know that's a big question. The first thing comes to mind is to try and accept the child for who they are and what they're doing right now, rather than trying to change them or educate them or make them go with the rules, et cetera, or achieve things in school. And the two levels of attachment are, one is just being with the child and flowing with them, connecting with them, being present with them. If they prefer to do something like play video games or play basketball or whatever their preference is, is just to be with them and not to wish that they were different. That's the way that you connect with a child and they will then be more interested in following you when you tell them that it's time to, you know, clean up your toys or that homework Mm -hmm. is important. Children are going to remember a lot more strongly the sense of a person who just is happy to be with them and accept them for who they are than the lessons like consequences and teaching and modeling and things like that are secondary to this more sense of connection and presence. And so that, I think that's one of the first things I would tell caregivers. I love it so much. And it is so, it's so counter to so much of what I think parents often think is my role is to teach and guide and model and sort of that like very top down idea. And what you are mm-hmm. saying is honestly, trust me, I've been doing this for a freaking quarter of a century and what your child needs. I remember watching this old Oprah interview that she did with Toni Morrison, where she, Toni Morrison was talking about like, Mm -hmm. it took me a while to get this as a mom, but I finally got that. Like when my kid would walk in the room, I would look them over and make sure their hair was combed and their shirt was clean. And it took me a while to realize that actually what my kid wanted to know is, is mom's face going to light up when they come in the room? It's just this beautiful. And like, it was her just like, that's what kids are asking is like, they're watching to see, does your face light up? Does auntie's face light up? Does stepdad's face light up when I walk in the room? Exactly. I love that Toni Morrison um, story. And it's exactly it. It's the same. My mentor, Phyllis Booth, who's going to be 98 next month, who's still, she is a guiding light in, in my life. And, and I turn to her often. The toddler who comes into the room and they are wanting to show you how they can jump off the couch or something like that. And they want you to clap mm-hmm. each time is something that stays, you know, the child needs to see that there's one person whose face lights up when they walk into the room. So I love, I love that what Toni Morrison wrote about, about her motherhood. I think that doesn't mean that you don't stay firm in your limits or your consequences. And I think the other thing is, you know, some of the reasons why parents can't tolerate and sort of give in to if a child is like begging and cajoling or is angry and they put a limit about screen time or about driving or about food or whatever it is, is they feel 
that the, the child's anger is making them feel so guilty as if they've done something to injure their child and that they're no good rotten parents. And it's just like, it makes you feel like you have this pendulum swing or you're just like, so you give in and then you have then the opposite reaction of saying, well, next time I'm not going to give in and I'm going to hold the boundary or hold the line. And my work with parents is to find out why, why do you feel so guilty? And Mm -hmm. sometimes that's really the source of the sort of being wavering back and forth between holding the consequences or the line or something and then giving in and feeling like, you know, I'm such a ridiculous parent because I can't hold the line or be firm with my child. They're really torn up about what they've done to their child, what they perceive, their perceived wrongs, and they're not forgiving themselves or it's something about their own attachment history. So if I see a parent who's, you know, really wavering and unable to be able to set those boundaries, I'm very supportive of parents putting consequences. I'm okay with that. It's it's up to you to decide what the consequences are, parent. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but if you cave in or you perceive yourself caving in, let's talk about what's tearing you up inside so much. What Or is it fear of conflict? Like there's a, a lot of things that if you can feel more solid, then you won't feel so threatened when you're child complains, whines, petitions, you can still be empathic and you can still hold the line. Yeah. What you're saying is that there's a way that our kids hold up a mirror to our own unhealed stuff. And that if we focus on that kind of pendulum swing of it's about the consequence, it's about when I'm giving in, when I'm not giving in, if we focus on that, we're missing that really powerful healing opportunity that we get ourselves as parents, which is to notice what, okay, what comes up in me when my child is angry at my desire to set a limit? What's uncomfortable in me? And what's that history there? That's that's what you're inviting a parent to look at. It is not so much that you're less concerned about where the line is or what the line is or what the consequence is. And you're more invested in a parent really starting to understand how their own attachment history or their own unhealed stuff is getting stirred up in that moment with the child. Right. Exactly. You you said it really well. It's really hard to figure that out by yourself as a parent. It's a really, really lonely place. And it's often, even if you have a parent co-parent, it sometimes is even worse because they have like opposite reactions that react to your reactions. Mm -hmm. And so just to normalize, one of the most important rituals that I do with parents in those sessions is the first thing is we pick a conflict that they had with their child. Yes, I love this. I was was going to ask you about this because this is so freaking good. Okay, so like, all right, talk us through this. I love, this was like, I had was like highlighting all over the place when I read this part. Okay, go. Oh, okay. (laughs) Sorry, I'm just all excited about this part. All right, so when you have a reaction to your child that's like really strong you know you feel super angry or you feel super rejected and you just want to give up or something that annoys the crap out of you right and so we talk about that in the parent only session what's one thing or name a couple of things which one do you want to work on and then we think about bring yourself to that moment and try to feel what it feels like in your body you might feel a constriction in your throat you might feel some sort of nausea in your tummy you know you have like a sense of just feeling like you're overwhelmed to the point where you just want to, you know, pass out. There's like really intense feelings. You have to tune into the body. Then we check in about what are you saying to yourself about yourself in that moment? That's a universal tenet of almost every therapy that's good, okay? Mm -hmm. Is we have to think our non-conscious voice is saying to ourselves or myself, this is all my fault. I'm a a rotten parent. I want to die. I should be able to control this. Mm -hmm. Things that are there, those negative cognitions, and they are usually very commonly things that we fall back on that we learned in childhood, right? No surprise. It's that template, that, that history that we carry. If you're able to slow down in this, it's a practice. It's just like the same, any kind of meditative practice, and it's a skill. If you're able to notice in the moment what your body is feeling, and become aware, what are you saying to yourself about yourself? Then you're able to respond. And this is the next step. Let's think of a message of self-compassion that you can respond with 
from your wise self or your some loving figure who, you know, I, I think of parents. And when I ask parents, like, who could be that wise self for you? A lot of people don't have that person within them. They're very critical. So we think of who might be a figure that you consider loving and benevolent and understanding and compassionate. And that message of self-compassion, we usually make a ritual of it, of putting your hand on your heart and saying, I'm okay as I am. And just metaphorically, I want you to rock yourself back and side to side and make a few self-compassion statements. I'm okay as I am. And then take a breath. And I tell the parent, I guarantee you, when you look at your child again, you know, if you take these 30 seconds and then you open your eyes and look at your child again, you're going to be able to see them better and what they need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because you will eliminate some of the static between you of what's coming up for you that's making it so hard to see what your child's actual form is telling you. A lot of times, the child might be, they're just really hungry or they're tired or they're collapsed and they, they can't hear you. And if you just tune into what their body is saying, you'll be able to understand and intuit a lot better what they need. But first you have to do this exercise, right? Yeah. And it's not something that you can learn right away. And that's why I do it in every session of the parent mm -hmm. session only. Because it's a practice. You have to do it when it's like little things, right? You can't do it when it's, so we have to practice it when they're calm. Because you have to be able to practice it in therapy in order to do it at home. Yeah. And that that part of closing your eyes, working on that self-regulation. And then when the parent opens their eyes, they can see, how did you say it? They can see the child, they can see the child in the child's form. And that was what you said in the beginning of this conversation is the vast majority of mental health problems. I mean, you, you know, the vast majority of what we see is the kind of downstream effects of this are because of a child who did not feel seen as they are, understood as they are. And so that practice of regulating oneself, closing one's eyes, and then opening their eyes to see the form that the child is in right now and to respond to that form, that's a practice. Okay, then, then you are able to do this thing that is like so nurturing and sustaining and vital, which is seeing the child as they are. How prideful for the parent, like, oh my God, look at me. I am seeing my child as they are rather than collapsing the space and rushing in or pulling back. I'm just, look at me, seeing my yeah. child as they are. Exactly. Oh. There's nothing a parent desires more than to be able, you said, the sense of pride of understanding my child and what they need. And if that's obstructed, if that's blocked, if you can't, you see the child has a need, but you don't understand what it is, or you think you understand it, but the child rejects you, it's devastating to the parental brain. And then the opposite is also true. If you're able to, you feel on top of the world. Oh. Okay, before I let you go, I have a couple of more questions. So one I was thinking about wanting to ask you is, I feel like I get a lot of questions on Instagram or in our listener question about how I don't know whether or not I want to become a parent. Like, By what means do I know whether I want to step into this parenting journey? So what would you say to somebody where that's a question of like, should I do this? Do I have the capacity to do this? And what are some things that, that somebody could be working on in their own life or attending to in their own life to help them ready themselves to step into this experience? Oh, that's a really cool question. I don't endorse, you know, having children or not, but Mm -hmm. The having a child is you can't get divorced from your child, right? So it's a journey that you, once you have a child, you're going to be uh, taken on the journey. So got to be open and flexible to being in some pretty existential moments of crisis and doubt, but also you can't even begin to imagine what things you're going to benefit from in terms of you know the, the growth, just on a personal level, I'm just talking about. Right. So I guess, are you interested in that kind of excitement? And I think that saying, I don't know, is a perfectly valid yeah. answer, right? Because most of us, many of us are not that intentional about becoming parents. There's a lot of things that in society, they're just like, you know, you grow up and you mm -hmm. get a partnership, you know, romantic partnership. And then you know, you, you have kids and, and that's just, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. what 
the society sort of rolls out for us. And that's okay too. And so I just think that if you are asking for a resource or some guidepost, it's going to be that when your child essentially triggers you by driving you crazy or making you feel helpless or powerless or something like that, there's two things. Like one is it's not your fault. You didn't do anything wrong, but it is your responsibility to look into what you're contributing to it so that you can then be able to make space for what your child really yeah. needs. And that's just a process, a lifelong process of learning. You're going to have to talk to friends. You're going to have to read books. You're going to have to go to a therapist. What a cool answer. I think it is, right. I think, you know, people like in our generation, like I think it was much more so the case where you just, right, it was that idea. Like if you have a partnership that is going to be, especially for folks who are cis and hetero, it was like, sort of like, it's just this little trajectory. You do this and you do this and you do this. And I think when I'm, especially with younger people, there is much more, like it is much more seen as an actual fork in the road, which is so cool. And it does then open up the possibility that you really do kind of like think yourself into a corner or you're looking for the five things that have to be just right if I'm going to do this. And so I love it in your response. It's sort of like, I don't know, are you wanting an adventure? Are you wanting to be kicked in the ass in all kinds of existential places? Like then parenthood might be for you. <laughs> you may, you know, like that, that's really, and how willing are you to be super humble and to resource yourself every step of the way? I think there's something even in that willingness to ask the question, like, how would I know? There's something like so lovely about that, right? Because yeah. in that question is this idea that like understanding that you're taking on a massive responsibility and it's not just making a kid and raising a kid. It is like being part of a really important, really sacred, really complicated journey alongside them. Yeah. So tell me before you go... I want you to talk a little bit about how a family could access integrative attachment family therapy, and then also how therapists can have opportunities to learn from you and with you. So can you start by, if there's a parent or family listening who is interested in accessing this kind of therapy, where could you send them? So my website is daphnalender.com. That's D-A-F-N-A-L-E-N-D-E-R.com. And in it, I have resources, the, the whole Inspired Parenting program, which is something that I've done and it's available online, is you can link it through my website. As far as the clinical services, I take people for short therapy uh, programs. I'm not doing long-term therapy anymore. So that's more sort of getting a clinical consultation from me over five to eight sessions. And the book is available on my website and all through, of course, through Amazon or anywhere where books are sold. And all my teaching programs are on my website as well. So the Integrative Attachment Family Therapy program that I'm doing is going to be coming up in September. But I also, I'm a trainer in two very important and primary modalities, theraplay and also dyadic developmental psychotherapy. And that's really the source of my inspiration, those two therapies. So those are also on my website. So that's pretty much where to go. Yeah. Whether you're a parent or mm -hmm. a provider, that your website right. is a great place to go to begin to look for these resources. And then even, I mean, sort of circling back to where we started, the other thing that I guess I would want parents to take away is that feeling of empowerment when they're looking for services for their child, that even if they aren't able to locate somebody who specifically has trained with you, somebody who really is going to be working with the parent in the room, that that's really, you want parents to feel empowered to ask for that and to really find supports for their children where they're going to be part of the treatment. Oh yeah. If, if I forgot to say that, then I should have said that at the very beginning, because what I want parents to know is that if they're looking for a clinician, they should ask the clinician to what extent and how the parent is involved. And if it's just, you know, the intake and then consultation as needed, or that's not structured enough, it's not integrative enough. I don't want the parent to be sitting off to the side. I want the therapist to be facilitating actual conversations, interactions with the parent and child. And that's what I would look for if I were a parent, like the consumer yeah. looking for that. And then also ask, you know, how are you as the clinic, like ask the clinician, how are you going to 
help me transform and, you know, teach me Mm. how to show up for my child better. You know, you said it in the beginning, but it is so freaking important that it was really important for you to say it again at the end, because that is like underline three times explanation points, because that is, I love when we're able to use the space and reimagining love to help people advocate for the kinds Mm -hmm. of clinical services that are really going to benefit them. And this is really clear. This is a really clear one. Thank you, Daphna. My distinct pleasure to be with you, Alexandra Solomon. Thank you so much, Daphna, for joining me here on Reimagining Love. If you want to engage with Daphna's work and her most recent book, Integrative Attachment Family Therapy, you can find links in the show notes. And thank you for joining me here. You know that I want to hear from you. What questions do you have about the parent-child relationship? You can write to me with questions about this topic or any other topic by using the link in the show notes. Until next time, be well. Reimagining Love is produced by Emily Reeves and edited by Mary Chan and Katie Pagich of Organized Sound Productions. Our theme music was composed by Slade Warnkin. Do you have a relationship question that you want answered on the show? Visit reimagininglove.com to send in a written or audio question. Questions can be about intimate partnerships, family relationships, friendships, you name it. If you're looking for more love and relationship content, you can find me on Instagram at dr.alexandra.solomon or visit my website, dralexandrasolomon.com, where you'll find my blog as well as the Intimate Relationships 101 e-course based off of the popular class I teach at Northwestern University. Thank you for listening and see you next week here on Reimagining Love.